Hi everyone. So welcome to our stream. My name is my name's Trent Naylor and I'm going to mute my own voice. Um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm from Torrance University. I'm an academic um, coordinator here and lecturer. Uh, I also have a background in game design and game development. And today I'm hoping to share with you a little bit of behind the scenes and a really quick kind of workshop tutorial um, sort of an example of how we might throw together a really sort of common, simple game, like something from Mario Party. Um, we're going to have, um, obviously, chat going on. So if you've got any questions or anything that comes up, please uh, throw it in there, and I'll do my best to answer it as we go. Um, and of course, later on, we can provide some details if you want to get in touch with me or ask any questions. Uh, just quickly, just so you know, Torrance University has been teaching games now for a while, and we have two main key areas that you can go into if you're interested in, at some point, getting into games development or working in the games industry. So we have a, an area called game design and development. And what we're doing today is, is a lot like that, where it's a little bit of everything, a little bit of animation, a little bit of um, throwing things together, maybe a little bit of scripting, understanding game engines, the production cycle, and all the pipelines. Uh, so it's a little bit of everything. And it's really useful if you're not exactly sure what you want to do or what you could be good at or where your place might be in the game design field and game development field. Um, and so you can really sort of find your place by doing a course like that because you get a little bit of exposure to everything. It's really good if you want to make your own games and if you want to go into sort of indie development as well. The other course area we have is software engineering with a specialization in game programming. And you can do both of these courses at both diploma and bachelor's levels. And if you do, say, a Bachelor of Software Engineering in game programming, it's highly specialized. It's all about programming. Uh, it's all about coding in C Sharp, C++, a little bit of math involved as well. And we teach you to be a software engineer first uh, and then to apply your skills specifically within games. So it's all about how do you program mechanics, do networking and physics and, and AI implementation and things like that. So I'm just going to make sure... We're all good. And then we'll get started. Now, before we do, you might also be aware that we have a competition running right now. So if you're someone that's hungry and wants some food, throw in the chat the dollar sign giveaway um, code word, and the first 20 people uh, will get a $25 Uber Eats voucher. All right. Cool, so let's get started. Now, I'm gonna be working in Unity today and I'm gonna be working specifically in something called the HDRP or the High Definition Render Pipeline. And what we're gonna do is we're going to quickly break down a mini game from the Switch version of Mario Party. Look at, quickly look at the kinds of mechanics and features that we would need to implement. And then approach this like a rapid prototyping session where we wanna get that core gameplay set up and working some of the features. And that gives us a foundation of where we would want to go from there. Now, of course, we're not going to do every single specific part today. We only have about 40 minutes to get through. Um, so like kind of like a cooking show, you know, I've pre-baked a lot of items and we're just going to sort of throw them up on the table and, and maybe just touch things up and connect the dots. Now, before we get started, what we're aiming for is something that looks and plays like this. So we'll just have a quick look at Mario Party. In particular, this is the Get Over It minigame. Now, you know, it's like 100 different minigames. This one has a really simple concept where you've got an obstacle coming either from the left or right. And basically, what we're looking at is that we, we need our characters to be able to jump over this obstacle as it approaches. And the clearance is not very much, right? So it's all about timing. So what we need to implement is we need the obstacle coming either from left or right, probably randomly. Uh, we need a player that is basically standing still and with a simple press of a button is able to jump. We need that jump to be able to clear the obstacle as it comes. And what we're also going to do today is implement some AI to do the same thing, because a big part of this particular game and how the mechanics work and how it sort of pushes you and confuses you is your AI are jumping just before or after you and it kind of throws it out for you. So we'll have a few AI characters as well. 
Um, we won't do split screen. Uh, we're just going to do us versus the AI. And the win or lose condition, which is a big part of games development, is that to win, we basically just have to outlast the AI. Now, if we are able to do that, then we win the game, then we can start again. If the AI manage to win, well, then we lose. So if we get hit by the obstacle, we land on it, we clip it or something like that, then we lose. Okay, so let's jump into it. So in the end, I want to try to make something that looks a little bit nice, um, that has some you know, reflections, some sort of high quality materials. Uh, I'm going to go for something that's not the sort of cartoony Mario look, that has the same gameplay feel. And we're not going to start here. Instead, we're going to start with something a little bit boring. So every good Unity project begins with a capsule. All right, so this capsule will be our player, and we've got some basic things set up um, around uh, at the moment, which is just some basic lighting. Okay, so we have a sun, and we have a, a camera that's showing our player. Um, we have a couple of spawn points, um, but right now, if I hit play, nothing happens except our capsule will probably fall off the screen. And there we go. So not exactly the Mario Party mini game um we're using so just as we're going a couple of questions already so the first one is um what's the hardest thing to do when making these mini games um it's a really good question the actual hardest part is not even necessarily the implementation or the ai it's the timings right so for something like this it all comes down to the feel of the timing and so when i was kind of preparing this the hardest part to get right was how quickly something was moving and how much time and clearance there was. So working that out and getting that to feel right is actually one of the hardest things to do. Most of these mini games are actually really simple. Um, and that's why there, you know, there's so many of them. But what makes them fun or you know, interesting to play over and over again is how they feel. If they feel, you know, you only need a really simple mechanic to feel nice and the game's enjoyable. Uh, the software is Unity. And we're using Unity 2021. I'm going to be programming in C Sharp. And I'll be using Visual Studio, but you could use Visual Studio Code or any editor to edit the code. And the other question is, uh, where did I get these assets? What's the best way to make assets like these? It's a great question. Now, um, in an ideal world, you know, it'd be great to make all, the, all your own assets. In a prototyping scenario like this, what I like to do is get placeholder assets or assets that are freely available. And there are many places you can get them. Everything I've gotten today, is free. Um, you'll see they're all free assets that either come with Unity in some sample packages, or they're available on the Unity Asset Store. And you can just download them. You get things like characters, environments, visual effects, and there is a huge amount of resources available there. And some people might think you know it's taking shortcuts, and the answer is yes, absolutely. Games development is hard. It's time consuming, and it costs a lot of money. So it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're Bethesda, Ubisoft, or a small indie developer. If you don't take shortcuts, you never get anything made. So we, we generally always look for ways we can do things faster, especially when we want to prototype and make something quick. Now, if you did want to make your own assets and you did want to learn how do I make the visuals, like how do I make characters and environments and things like that, of course, we teach it. If you want to come and learn uh, from our courses, you could do that. But if you want to get started today, I'd recommend something like Blender or even Maya, which has free accounts for, for students and independent developers. Um, but if you grab Blender, watch some tutorials, Blender Guru on YouTube, and get started, you start learning the basics of, say, 3D modeling. All right, let's keep going. So we've got a few things that we want to be able to do here. Um, and we want to be able to set this up so that at the very least, we can get this capsule to jump. So we need some ground. So I'm just going to start off, and this is how we start a lot of projects like this. We've basic blocking out what are the main elements that I need before I start worrying about making it look good. So I'm going to go here and create a 3D object called the plane. And this plane is just a really simple object. And you'll see what I'm doing right now is I'm in the scene view on the left here in Unity. This is like a, a way for me to edit um, what's called a scene or a map or a level. And I can make changes. And then on the right here is my game view. So what you'll see is I'll edit everything here on the left. And everything on the right or when i play it in full screen is what the actual game will look like through the camera okay so i can create something like this like a plane i could just scale it out because it's not going to matter because we're going to replace this in the end and it's white and bright so i might want to just add a material to it so if i head over 
to my folder where I have a whole bunch of files and assets and materials that I can use. Um, I've got, you know, textures here. I've got materials. I've got models I could use. So I'm just going to jump in here and I've got um, some textures that will just make things not look oh so white, right? So again, we're going to replace all this. Now I've got my capsule. If I hit play, my capsule will should land on that plane and I'm good to go. Bam, yeah, great. Uh, so I, hitting spacebar, which will be my jump, nothing happens yet. So that's what we're going to have to think about doing next. <laughs> there we go. We've already got these things moving across. OK, so right now, to get my player to act and to move within uh, the Unity engine, I need a bit of code. Now, coding can take a while, so I've gone ahead and pre-baked some things for us. So if I head over here and look at my player, how it's set up, the player has a mesh, which is this capsule. It has a collider and a rigid body, which takes care of something called collision detection and physics. The rigid body gives it mass, right? So we can add velocity or we can add forces to it. And this is how we might approach something like a simple jump, right? So if I want the character to be able to jump up, then it's really just a matter of applying a force in the upwards direction. So if I can apply a force to something that has mass, then the physics engine, which has gravity and has a whole bunch of other things going on, should take care of allowing for that sort of you know, that um, hyperbolic motion of going up, going down on a curve. So I've got my rigid body, got my capsule. I also have input taken care of. So I'm, I'm waiting for input, but I'm just not doing anything with it yet. What I'm going to go do is I'm going to add component and I'm going to add a script that I've already prepared, but it's not complete. So we might have to add a little bit to it called player control. So I've set this script up, which is considered a component in Unity, to have a bunch of settings, attributes, and features that I need. And what's great about how Unity works and why it's such a great engine to start learning game development is that it introduces you to a concept called object-oriented programming, and even some more complicated things like programming design patterns. And the pattern here is a component object pattern where you have an object, like a player, and to add functionality, you add components to it. Think of it like modifying a car, right? So if you had a car that didn't have a stereo and you wanted to put a stereo in, well, you wouldn't just go buy a new car, or you might nowadays, but you could buy the stereo as a separate component and add it to your car. Now your car has the ability to make sounds and, and play music. It's no different here in a game engine. We have a basic object and we just want to add features to it. And one of these features is a script I've written that allows us to do things like jump. So I've got some things here that says, you know, is it a player? Yes. What's the jump power? Well, we'll come to that in a second. Right now it's set to one. Am I alive? Am I currently jumping? Can I jump? So programming is all about control. We want to define what we can and can't do. So we want the player to be able to jump, but only jump when we want it to and not just whenever it feels like it. Okay. So I've done that. I've added this, this component. And if I go ahead and hit play now, we'll see if anything happens. Wait for it to load. Nothing happens, right? So we're still missing some functionality. OK, so let's go ahead and have a look at this script now. And we'll see what we need. We'll save our scene. And we'll open up into C Sharp. Now, if you've never done any programming, that's OK. Um, programming is not as tricky as it may look. Often, coding is about writing things in a way that makes sense. And often if you read it and you read it out loud and it's written well, it'll actually make sense as you read it. So we've got these things here called functions, which you'll see sort of start in purple and they'll say things like public void. And then these blue names like on jump, handle jump, victory, die. And these functions, just think of them as things we want to happen. So in this case, I've got something here called on jump, which is an event. And it says that basically if the game is running, we want to we want to register that jump should happen. And so it comes down here and it says, OK, you've told me handle jump. Let's do it. Can we jump? Yes. Well, what are we going to do if we can jump? Well, right now, nothing. So all we need to do is think, well, what kind of code do we need? And we hinted at that before. We have on this object a rigid body. If we apply force to this rigid body, we can get it to move. So let's go ahead and say do the jump. To do the jump, we're going to have to say get component rigid body. So we're going to access that rigid body component that we mentioned. 
and we're going to add a force. Where's the force going? What direction is it going in? Well, it goes in a vector, and we're going to use a shorthand called vector3.up. This means we're going to apply in a force in the up vector, right? It's a relative direction, but we're going to say in the y or the up. And we're going to scale it by saying vector3.up multiplied by, and what did we see we had here on the right? Jump power. So now we can tweak how much power we put into our jump. And the type of force we're going to add, Unity has the ability to do different types of force. So we're going to say the force type that we're going to apply, force mode.impulse. So it's going to apply all that force in one go and not continuously. And that's it. One line of code should allow us to add force to an object and then get a result based on the physics simulation. So we're going to save. Again, we're going to quickly recompile this and hit play. Again, feel free to ask questions as you're going. I can't actually see my Twitch questions because my window is too small, but my handy helper Woody is posting them in uh, Discord, so I'll see them anyway. All right, so let's hit play. Let's hit spacebar and let's see if we get any motion. Oh, we have just an ever so slightly small little jump there. So we have something, something's happening. Let's move out of the way. So we've got a few errors down here now. So the question is, why do we have errors? Now, errors seem like it would be a bad thing. They're red and they say, hey, there's something wrong. Errors are a great thing if you're a programmer or a game developer, because an error tells you exactly what you need to fix. The worst kind of errors in a game are the ones that are in red and the ones that don't scream and tell you exactly what's wrong. So bugs, let's say you just downloaded some brand new indie game called Cyberpunk um, and you realize that there's all these strange bugs like animation issues and things, quests not working. Most of the time, these are what we might call logical errors. They're not actually coding errors, but they're these complexity errors. And when you have a complexity error, they only occur when certain things, when the stars align. And it can be really hard to find um, unless it's through really, really extensive playtesting. And then even then, sometimes it's not until you scale that out into hundreds of thousands of users that suddenly these errors appear. So I have a lot of forgiveness for companies when they put out games, because I know how difficult it is to catch all these bugs. Okay, so what we're missing here is something that says that we need a constant force, and we also have an area here. So I'm going to deal with this constant force. Now, this constant force is an ability for us to add another component that will apply a force constantly on this object in a certain direction. Now, why would I want that? Well, we'll get to that in a second once we fix our jumping. So I'm just going to leave that there. And instead, I'm going to say, well, my jump power one wasn't working, so let's make it 12. Let's hit play, and then let's see why we might want to have a constant force. Oh, all right. So jumping's working, but I'm jumping pretty high. Now, what I could do is I could reduce the jump power. But what we'll find is that if I reduce the jump power and I make the height not as high, you'll, what you'll notice is that the the default settings here of just standard gravity, which is downward force of minus 9.8 meters per second per second, has a really floaty feel, right? And we would think that something that relates to real life, that if we make our physics as close to possible as what real life is, that that would be the most fun and most interesting experience, when in fact it's not. Jumping actually is very floaty, right? So if you jump, the time, the acceleration it takes for you to pick up speed and velocity to and reach that minus 9.8 meters per second, it takes so long that you actually get a really floaty feeling in a game. And so almost every game that pays attention to how its jump works actually um, applies additional force or uses a custom algorithm to make it so that the upwards force and the downwards force are actually far more snappier than they would be in real life. So for us to do that, basically what we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna leave this upwards force of 12, which is gonna give us this, this sort of big impactful uh, immediate bounce, but would normally send us really high, but then we're gonna counteract it with a downwards force. 
So I'm going to say here that the constant downwards force is minus 20. So it's going to add this constantly. It's a little bit like adding a bit of extra weight, but it's going to pull us down. There we go. So now when I jump, I actually get this far more snappier jump. There we go. And I lost. And so to answer that question before about what's really hard, this is the hard part. So the hard part is getting these values all sort of dialed in so that the jump is just the right height. So it feels like you really have to kind of put in just the right timing to clear an object or to jump onto a platform or something like that. All right, so we just got um, an error here, which says get component in children, character skin controller. Now this is what's, this is something that we'll come back to later. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna comment this out so that error goes away. And this will just change our material color compared to the AI. Okay. All right, so we have our jump. We have some objects coming in uh, on the left and right, but why are those objects appearing and how are they appearing? So I have another object here called the game manager. And this is a script that we've written that is going to be the thing that manages our game state. So is our game currently doing nothing? Is it idling? Is it in the menu? Are we winning? Have we won? Have we lost? Are we playing? So if you think about all of those things that you would need for a game scenario, Normally we have kind of a central manager for that, something that it also where all roads lead to. And this is going to cover things like, well, maybe how long's around? How often do the obstacles get spawned? Where do they get spawned from? And so I have these set up where I say, I have got a certain obstacle that I want to spawn. And this is called obstacle. So I'm going to open this up. And all it is is just a cylinder, a boring cylinder. And what my game is currently doing is that it's taking that cylinder, it's spawning it in the level at a certain point, which are these little cubes over here. Now these cubes are here just so I can see the point. And this is just going to be a location in space that my cylinder will appear. And then the cylinder takes on a life of its own. The cylinder rotates and then just moves in a certain direction. And so at the end of the day, I'm just spawning cylinders left and right, and they just move towards the player. So we have another question is, can you make buttons to customize the weight of the object, changing the rate of falling? And how can that be done? Um, you absolutely could. So there are basically everything about the rigid body can be customized, um, depending on what it is that you want to do. So if we were to take a really quick look at that and how that works, just to break it down, um, a rigid body has a, just a a small set of really important um, values, right? The first one is mass, right? So our mass here is one, okay? So if you remember back to physics or if you're studying physics now, you'll know that there's a, little, there's a bit of a difference between mass and weight, right? So it all depends on what gravity or what forces are being applied to mass to get your weight. So if we have a mass of one and then we have a drag of zero, then we can, we can calculate the speed or the velocity or the acceleration based on the force applied to that mass of one, right? If I increase the mass, okay, so which is not weight, but it's mass. If I increase the mass, well, then we just need more force to begin to reach the same type of acceleration. The thing about jumping, right, is that we've got a constant force being applied. So it, it will take longer right for that um, uh, acceleration to to reach what it needs to be but it's not but it's not going to necessarily speed it up because there's a constant force being applied right of gravity minus 9.8 meters per second to to get it to go faster right so because all the all a tweak in mass will do will change how quickly we get to that maximum velocity to make it go faster, we're going to need to apply more force. And that's why we added the constant force. And there's, this is why there are lots of in games development and in, in this, there are lots of ways to the same result. So what I'm doing is one way to, to reach that point, but we could manually set the velocity for instance. So I can actually access that rigid body and say dot velocity, and I could set its velocity to a certain vector, which is going to be 
you know, a certain speed we could think of it as if I wanted to. Um, I could tweak the mass as we go. We could create buttons to, to tweak and change the mass if we wanted to. And we could play around with how all, all of those things work. So they're all within reach of us to tweak and get the sort of physics effect that we want. I hope that kind of answers the question. Okay, so we've now got our, our object and we're looking at the game manager. We have an obstacle, it's spawning either left or right. Um, and we have some things here, which is just a timer, uh, which is saying, okay, we've got five second round time length. And if we have a look at how this code quickly works, basically what we're doing is we're saying, okay, we're going to, we're going to say if the game is running and all the AI players are alive um, and they're, you know, they're still playing, well then skip over this and come down here and start doing a round timer. Now all this round timer does is say, have a timer run and when it reaches a certain point, reset it and spawn an object. And so we get this kind of timer loop. And this is a really useful thing uh, to make quite early on because many things in games happen on repeat and happen on loops. And so these little loop sets of code are really useful. And what I have underneath here then is saying, well, if we set the spawn state to spawn, then we'll come down here, we'll reset the round timer and we'll spawn an obstacle. Okay, and this obstacle will spawn at either the left or the right. Um, and it's gonna, it's gonna roll towards the player. It's gonna reset um, the timer and it might randomly spawn another one. Uh, the other thing I've kind of added here is that this spawn obstacle, we can set how many we want to spawn. So, well, if we notice, if we play the Mario Party minigame, sometimes one comes across from the left, sometimes two or three, and they come in groups. And so we can randomize that as well. What I haven't done today is randomize the speed, right? Because that would actually throw out a lot of our sort of balance. Um, but we could, once we sort of had a nice algorithm dialed in, we could say, well, if the speed is this, then the jump timing and things need to be that. Okay, so that's our, that's our game manager. Uh, later on, we'll come through here and we'll also play around with some of this code here uh, to tweak it. All right, so we've handling our jump. We've got our character, uh, which is a capsule at the moment. Uh, what we don't have is AI. So let's go ahead and put some AI in. If I go down here, I've got a prefab here of AI and I'm gonna drag it into the scene. And you'll see this AI looks a little bit different to our player. So what we're gonna end up doing is we're gonna make our AI and our player look the same. So if we have a look at them side by side, our AI and our player are actually very similar. So one of the best ways to make AI is first of all to make a player and then to essentially base your AI on the player but with some tweaks. Now, for anyone that's done some programming before, a really effective way to often do this is through inheritance. So you can think of both the AI and the player inheriting from a really common set of rules and functionality. Just to keep things simple today, I haven't done that. Instead, what um, we have is both the AI, if I select the AI, and the player, they both make use of the player control script. But they both jump with the same functionality. They both have that constant force. They both have rigid bodies. So they're essentially exactly the same. The exception is that the AI is given another script that controls its input and its brain and everything else it needs to do that you are doing for the player. And that is a basic principle to how most AI is designed, right? Is that if you design it like the player, especially if it's similar to the player, then you can just generate the kind of input that the player does, and then you can kind of get a more natural feeling or similar feeling to what the player is doing. Now, of course, it differs if the AI is very different to the player, and then you need a very sort of customized solution. But when your AI basically is the same as your player, then what you're really designing is how the input works, and then you have to mitigate the power of AI and why my AI can work so well. Okay, so I've got my AI character, I've got my player, but my player doesn't look like my AI character. So let's go ahead and start tweaking the visuals so that they start to represent each other. So I'm going to go to my player, 
And what I've already done, if I open up this as a prefab, is I already actually have this robot as a sub object or a child object. And I'm going to turn on this child object. And then I'm going to go to this capsule and I'm not going to delete the capsule. I'm not going to delete all of that sort of key functionality like the inputs, the controller, the capsule, the collider. It's going to turn the capsule off. And so what we end up with is we end up with basically two states for this object. And this is another really important game development principle is that what we've done is we've separated the visual state from the functional state. So if we have a look at player workshop here, the player workshop has all of the functionality. It has the ability to jump and it has importantly the, the collider, right? So in green, this capsule, it might be difficult to see here. This collider and the functionality is actually the game, right? The game is not the visuals as much as it is the functionality behind the scenes. The visuals is just a model with animations that sits on top. And it's something we could switch out, that we could change, that we could tweak without it affecting the functionality. And this is how most elements are designed in games, where we separate the functionality from the visuals. And so we can do we can apply changes to one without necessarily affecting the other. Now, of course, these things have to overlap, they have to align with each other. Um, but it's far easier for your artist to work independently to your coders and your programmers. We have another question which says, what's the most common issue that arises when coding a game like this? Uh, that's a really good question. Most common issue. I would say the most, the most common issue with most games, but even with a game like this, is uh, over com like complexity and something we call coupling. So... As you make anything uh, with code, at first, it's quite simple, right? You don't have much code. Think of it like writing an essay, right? When you write your first paragraph, well, there's not much complexity to it. The paragraph in and of itself makes a lot of sense. What happens when you've written four, five, six, ten paragraphs? Well, suddenly the relationship between the paragraphs is important. What paragraph comes before another paragraph before another? the order and then the intertextuality, like the, the relationship between the paragraphs starts to, starts to matter. It's the same with programming in that the more elements I add in and the more code I add in, the more potential there is for there to be important connections between them. And then I start getting a bit of a spider web of connections. And what can happen even in a simple game is that I make a change over here that affects something over here. And that's because there's a hidden coupling between them, a relationship. And it might be an absolutely necessary relationship where the player is affected by another object. And if I change that object, suddenly the player is unintentionally affected. And there are lots of programming principles that can be applied to help mitigate that, but you can never mitigate it completely. Another question is, would this visual capsule have the same functionality to hit boxes? It not only has the same functionality, it is the same functionality. So when we when you hear about hit boxes in games, whether it's um, you know Apex or Valorant or something like that, you're actually talking about the colliders. You're actually talking about collision detection. Um, and it's a perfect example of that separation between functionality and visuals because the colliders are designed to match the visuals, but they don't have to. So in this case, you'll see that my capsule actually, by design, is going a little bit over my head. And I've got these other little gaps here, right, under my arm. And this is where you find those strange instances in hitboxes, right, where you'll shoot somebody. It's not that you actually hit their mesh, what we would call their mesh or the actual model, but you hit maybe just under it, just beside it, and you hit the collider that's actually picking up that collision, whether it's a, um, a ray cast, like a hit scan, or whether it's an actual projectile moving through space and it collides with it, the principle is the same. So they're one and the same thing. And it's really tricky to, again, to get that right, because the complexity of a collider can add performance issues. 
And so what you're actually looking for often is very simple shapes. The simpler the shapes, the more efficient it works because the math is basically simpler, right? So the capsule is just two spheres, right? Basically one sphere, another sphere, and two, two lines that join them on either side. Uh, that was a really great question. Okay, so I've got my character. I've set him up. Uh, Oppo, it's a robot. It really doesn't really matter. Um, let's go back to the scene. And I'm just going to adjust where everything's starting to spawn. So right now, these are all just a little bit too high. So I'm going to bring them down to 0 0.75. I'm going to take my character as well and just pop him down on the floor. Take my robot. My AI. And we'll just go ahead and... Put them side by side. Okay. So if I hit play, let's have a look and see what happens. How are we going for time? Good. Yep. Okay, so now they've both got these little idle animations here. And we'll just wait and we'll see. Something swans. Oh, a bit too low. And he flew up in the air. But he jumped over. All right. All right. So we might just we'll just dial in a few of these things. Take our left and right spawners. I think put them at one. We'll have a look at our AI player. Let's make sure that the AI player has also that constant force. Yep. And uh, he jumped very high. All right. Well, maybe we'll come back for that. All right. So what we could do is go ahead and add more of these. So I could duplicate. And we'll add another one on this side, another one on this side. Yep, I'm hitting the wrong button, apologies. So we'll add five altogether. I knew there was a secret one hiding in there. I got a little bit of lag and I double. So where is it? That one. These two. Yep. So let's delete that one. Okay. So we have. Let's delete that. No. One, two, three, four. All right, let's hit play. And what we should find is they all have the same functionality, so they should all do the same thing. And what they're doing is that they're currently monitoring the obstacles coming towards them. And once the obstacle reaches a certain distance, they jump, except for the huge jump they're doing, which I'm not actually sure why, but we'll, we'll problem solve it in a second. All right, so I've got my player and we've got these all, all these AI jumping. So let's have a look. Let's just make sure they haven't got some crazy setting something I clicked on for accidentally. They have their constant force, they have their control, and they're just doing a big jump. I'm not sure why they're doing their big jump. We'll just leave them be for now. All right. So let's go and tweak a few other things and then see if that resolves our issue. So one of the issues is if we have a look at how our AI is programmed, what we'll find is that basically I've got some testing here, which is just saying, is the obstacle on my left or right? So should I worry about jumping? Uh, I should only worry about jumping if it's on the side that was coming towards me. And if it is getting close enough to me, so if it reaches a threshold of being at the moment two units away from me, then I'm going to jump. And now the problem with this is that it makes your AI perfect, right? So if I just zoom in here, basically the, the one of the tricky parts, and this is probably to answer that, that question about what arises with coding game like this, one of the tricky parts is actually making our AI dumb. Okay, so by default, when you program the rules for an AI to work, your AI works every time. So right now our AI is jumping too high, but if it wasn't, we would have our AI perfectly jumping nonstop, right? So our AI would constantly jump 
uh, and there would be no issues. So I really would like to show you that. So I'm going to just save my scene. I'm going to move my player out of the way. I'm just going to reload my scene. We'll see if that makes any difference. So got my AI. It could be also because it could be physics clipping through the ground. We'll just make sure that we'll see if that's the case. <laughs> that's a. I mean, it's technically working. They're just kind of supermaning straight up into the sky, um, which is not what we want. And now I, I'm wondering what's what's the issue? Why is it doing that? So we'll just, let's double check. And we'll do a little bit of live debugging. So our mass is one, our drag is zero. We've got gravity. Do these guys have gravity? Did I accidentally tick something off? Let's have a closer look. Everything looks good there. The ragdolls are off, so they're not going to. We have our animators, which shouldn't be causing any issues. And our jump power is the same as our player, exactly the same as our player, which is 12. We have a constant force of minus 20. Might just be a weird. So let's see what happens if we make this one. We'll see if it makes a difference. If not, it's okay. We'll just call it a live bug. So this guy's working, but for whatever reason, all of our values are blown out. Okay, well, let's just go and reduce all of their jump powers. And maybe we wrote something wrong in our code. Unless I entered the wrong one. Apologies. Let's open it up again. So we haven't prevented we haven't prevented our our jumping from happening multiple times. That might be the issue. Because and then we were going to do the animation. So let's also call the animation, right? So we have an animator on these objects. And this is what real programming and game development's like. It's basically pro constant problem solving. Something works one day and then suddenly it doesn't and you're like, it's because I didn't carry the one. Uh, so let's have a look at quickly at this animator. So basically we have what's called an animation state machine. And an animation state machine is just a set of rules that help us transition between one animation cycle and another. Now we just have some very simple animations that came with this object. And so this one is basically called, it's, it's a fall to landing and I'm using it instead of the jump because it looks a little bit better. So I scroll through this, you can see it's like, it's like a land, but it actually works as a jump, right? And I'm going to call this in my code. So I'm going to come up here and say, um, call the animation. And we're going to say, well, I had, I'm going to talk to my animator and I'm going to set a trigger called jump. And fingers crossed our little missing code is what was causing our player AI not to jump correctly. Okay, digitally cross your fingers for me. All right, three, two, one. 
Hey, there we go. Down they all go. All right, and my guy gets really happy to do one. All right, hooray, we fixed the issue. Um, okay, let's finish up. So let's take our player, move them back to the center. So we have our player and we have our AI. And let's start making the visuals a little bit better. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to my obstacle and apply the same principle. So if I go to my obstacle prefab, the main thing that matters here is actually this sphere, right? The sphere, the green sphere is my hitbox or my collider that's going to hit my other hitbox and collider and tell my player or AI that they've been hit. The visuals, well, they can be just replaced. So right now I have a cylinder. I'm gonna turn off the cylinder and I'm gonna turn on a model. That might look a little bit familiar, but it's an inspired by junk rat wheel. So we're going to use this not junk rat wheel to be our spike on. So let's go ahead and return back to our scene and we'll see that that little quick change of just switching out the model, the visual without changing any code should mean that we end up with our obstacles looking a little bit more interesting. And there we go. All right, now let's think about the environment. Right now you can see this weird environment I have in the background. It's actually called the HDRI map. So this is just like a 360 degree panoramic image taken at a whole bunch of different exposure levels. And the reason we have something like that is to generate really useful lighting and color information, right? So the things that make things look real is generally the fact that light bounces around, right? And there's a whole bunch of different potential exposure levels that happen when I open and close windows, and depending on how dark or light it is in the scene. And so when you hear about HDRI and HDR, it's all about managing these, these, um, these light levels. And if we have a good HDRI map, it improves the overall quality, but it's not actually something we wanna look at in this case. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace it. And I'm just gonna hide it in the background with the little pre-built level that I've made here from some assets that were already part of an example project. So I'm just gonna move it into place. Something like this. And let's move around, we wanna center it. Like that. And let's bring that wooden floor up. And we'll do something like this. Okay. So basically all we've got here is just a few simple meshes, a couple of walls. We've got a skylight here. And this big black box is basically to block out all of the light that we don't need. The other useful thing that was kind of added to this is some, you know, a little bit of volumetric light rays to just to make things look a little bit nicer. So I'm going to go ahead and add even a little bit extra here. So I'm going to go to my effects and lighting. I'm going to add a density volume. And this just allows my light to sort of interact with the texture and create a little bit kind of like a fog, foggy effect, like we're hitting dust. All right, so it'll be subtle, right? But it actually adds a lot. So I don't know if you can if you can kind of see that as I move it across the light coming in through that window. And so what you're probably realizing, whether you have experience in game development yet or not, is that everything's faked, right? So the reason games run so well is that there really isn't lies of rate, you know, rays of light hitting real fog. It's all kind of a, these kind of tricks that kind of work out. Uh, the other thing I want to do is add some, what's called a reflection probe. And a reflection probe helps us generate reflections because unless you're doing some crazy fully ray trace game, which eventually we'll get to, where you're actually measuring light bouncing off all these objects and generating reflections and accurate shadow maps, 
then reflections are actually pre-calculated. Right? You might have heard the term say something like screen space reflections. And it basically, it, it's like taking a, a photo, right? So you have your camera and you take like a photo of your surroundings and then you basically mirror that on surfaces that you want to look reflective. And so they're not real reflections, they're just kind of approximations of it. And so a reflection probe basically says, well, we don't want to do that all the time everywhere because that's really expensive. We just want to do it sometimes in some places where we need it. And so I'm just saying this area here defined by this probe, which I'm going to make a little bit bigger. I want to capture the reflection information and then bake it or paint it into the map. And at first it doesn't look like it's done anything. And what we actually need to do, and we'll be, we'll be finishing up soon, we'll finish just at five, is I'm gonna go render lighting, and I'm gonna go to my environment here, I'm gonna generate the lighting, which is gonna generate this information, and I'll answer a question while it's doing that. I'm gonna hit generate lighting, and you'll start seeing this change as it happens. So we have uh, a question which says, what can you do to make each individual character recognize a completely unique controller device? Like with the Switch Joy-Cons, Pro Controllers, they change based on which device connects first. Oh, that is a really, really key question because I have had that exact same problem. Um, the, the way that it's being addressed is through the new input similar, which is what I'm actually using on this project. And I'm not completely like 100% familiar with all of its functionality, but I do believe built into it because it's more of a low level system at this point, basically, is that you should be able to address the things like the order in which controls are um, plugged in on the base device, just like that. Where the, you know, because the big setup is that you're driving, because it changes basically the people which you see who's playing one, two, three, four, 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 four. So then they're more local level solution. The other thing is uh, it is probably more of a programming solution like how the switch makes it work, which is that you have a settings option that allows you to do, um, sort of at a, at a higher level determine Irrespective of the of the order of the connected the system, but you have a high level which says, okay, um, controller two is going to be mapped to play that, right? So you don't only switch when you hold left and right, and you can choose who's player one, who's player two. I think that's actually probably the most reliable way, where you, if you know you're going to have all these variables and things plugged in, we give the player the ability to. Yeah. Same thing like maybe because the lighting has been generated. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So generating lighting is probably quite intense, but we just finished. So give me a thumbs up. Yeah, all good. Okay, so. I was getting some lag because my GPU and CPU were going crazy generating the lighting and also streaming at the same time. Um, so the short answer to what my long-winded answer was, was basically if the issue with the controller is connecting, the simplest solution is to have a higher level solution that allows your player to say, map um, this controller to this player, right? So irrespective of the order in which they're connected, you basically say, just like on the switch, when you press your left and right triggers, you say, okay, who's going to be player one? Press left and right trigger. And then you do like a soft map to that. And then you store that information uh, in memory um, for that instance. Uh, you could potentially save it later. To get a more lower level solution, there might be something in the new Unity event based input system, which I'm using at the moment, but I'm not super familiar with it. Um, I'm only just actually starting to use it now. I've been using the old input system for like 10 years. Um, but it had a lot of limitations like the one you're describing. Okay, so you, you'll see that after we've generated the lighting, we now have reflection information, right? So you can see this material is actually reflecting on the wood. We're getting minor reflections of the characters. What we're getting is something called global illumination, where the light is bouncing off all the other objects and 
and it's taking its color information like in real life and moving it to other objects. And so you get something that looks a little bit more closer to life. You get things like these light and nice soft shadows coming in on the edges here, where light is sort of creeping in under here. We also have something called ambient occlusion, where the closer two objects are together, the higher it is for light to escape. So we're getting like these kind of crevice shadows. And these are all things that are particularly built in really nicely into the high, defi high definition render pipeline. These are the things for those that are interested in what separate like high quality graphics from, from low quality. Unity generally doesn't look all that, that good by default, but it can look as good as Unreal. Um, it's just a matter of having all of the settings set right. I would say, if you want to know what my, my opinion is, Unreal looks better out of the box. And if we're talking about really how high level we can get with the graphics, Unreal far exceeds Unity's ability. But Unity has a lot going for it in terms of prototyping and other customization. Okay, so we've done that. Last thing I'm going to do, got a couple more minutes to finish up, is I'm going to add some particle effects because the problem with a virtual world is that because it's not real, there is no real air, there is no real environment, there's no real anything. And so we have to kind of fill in the gaps. So I'm going to add in here dust. And it's a simple effect, but what it does is that it gives us a little bit of just enough sort of ambient feel for air. And that makes that can make a huge difference to placing our objects in what is like a real space. So if you have a look at the scene right now, these robots and all the bounce lighting, they all feel so much more real, right? They always feel they feel like they're in the place, that they're all connected. And that's what often separates sort of higher quality graphics versus low quality. Now we go full stylized like Mario Party, but in this case, not. So let's actually play, and then I'm going to add one last thing. And yep, this is all good. You can see my robots, they're all jumping pretty well. But right now, the last little thing is my robots are too good, right? They're way too good. And unless they get really tripped up, I'm not going to be able to win. So the final piece of the puzzle is let's make our robots dumb. So I'm going to go to my AI character and I'm going to come down here to something I've called the brain ticker, right? And this is just going to be a delay that I'm going to add to make my robots randomly a little bit dumb, right? So that their reaction times are not perfect every time. So I'm going to delete the call to jump here. And instead I'm going to say, start coroutine. Coroutines are really great and they're really useful for when we want to add delays to things instead of things happening immediately. So I'm going to say, well, I need to add a delay and I'm going to make it a random number, right? So it's not exactly the same every time. So I'm going to say random.range and it's going to be a random number between zero, which will be perfect, right? So that'll be just the same as it was before. It'll be an immediate reaction and brain power. So in this case, the higher the brain power, the dumber my AI is going to be because it'll increase the likelihood that it'll be like, oh, there's something coming for me. I should jump. And then we simply replace this yield return with a yield return new wait for seconds. And our wait time is going to be that random number. Once we've waited or we've delayed our reaction time, then we'll jump. The great thing is this will randomize every time. We could tweak it. We could add difficulty settings. There's a lot we could do to actually make the AI increase in difficulty. We could make it get dumber over time, or smarter over time, and we could do it all simply by tweaking one number. And that's what's really useful for a game designer. And that's often to kind of finish up what I started with when we have these different fields like design, um, you know, artistry and development and programmers. A good programmer will program tools that allow designers to make easy changes. Okay, so let's go ahead and hit play. And this will be our final, our final thing. And we'll see how, how, how we go. Let's see if we can win. And I lost. And they're all cheering. We'll give it one more go. Let's see if I can at least get one of them to die. Now, what I've also added in here, but would love to go through on a later time is things like ragdolling, 
um, camera animations. Um, so I had some camera animations set up. And oh, we still lost. And we have a question. Do you need lots of experience to be able to make an amazing game like this? Um, yes and no. So I would say a lot of what I'm doing today, which is, you know, it seems better than it is, right? So the complexity of the code is actually not very high. And I would say that if you, let's say you just learned to, to make a game, um, you could probably make this after maybe, you know, a few months of, of learning. Once you get sort of the, used to how things work, there is a lot, of, it's very simple what I'm doing here. The complexity is probably in, and I've got a lot of experience with the game engine, with a lot of the principles. So I understand a lot of the little bits and pieces like how effects work, how um, lighting works, and a lot of these things that sink a lot of time and can be really quite tricky. Um, but at a lower level, at just sort of the base functionality, absolutely, this is something uh, my first trimester, first year students could make. And we would absolutely do this type of game in a rapid prototyping class. And I would expect this kind of outcome after a couple of weeks. So I would give a team a, a brief and say, hey, make a Mario Party mini game. And they should be able to produce something like this or even better within a few weeks. And that's after about a year, year and a half of, of experience. Um, but within the first, even the first few months of, of studying, you could be making games like this that look just as good as this or even better. Um, this is for me, this is just a quick prototype to give you guys an idea. All right, so thanks guys. Um, I really enjoyed going through this with you. I hope you got some really interesting insights. And if you have any questions, you wanna reach out to me, um, my email is trent.naylor at torrens.edu.au. If someone can chuck that in the chat for me, you can also check us out on Twitch. Um, we've always got stuff coming up um, with Meta and with our own Billy Blue channels um, and all the social media platforms. All right, that's it for me. I'll see you later. Bye.